Um, so uh, we're going to launch into, uh, this is Steve Moretzky, uh, former colleague of mine at Platum. Um, for about four years, we've been doing an annual kind of quick look at what are the most interesting, ga uh, interesting developments in the social gaming market, really deep diving on Facebook and market trends there. Um, as I've told many people, it's always entertaining and we pretend to be informative. Uh, so with that in mind, please don't hold us to any standard of note. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get some reasonable information out of the next hour. You seem to have a much lower standard for entertainment than most people. <laughs> so the big question is whether the bloom is off the rose of social gaming. During the past year, Zynga went public with somewhat disappointing results, and a few months later, Facebook also went public and disappointed investors. As of last week, the number one game on Facebook was the five-year-old Texas Hold'em Poker with a little over seven million DAUs, or daily active users. Now, that's the lowest total for a number one game on Facebook in about three years since before Farmville launched. And again, for the second year in a row, many formerly strong competitors in this space either went away completely or pivoted out of the social gaming space. And a lot of the hype around social gaming has now moved on to mobile gaming. In fact, when Dave and I started doing this talk four years ago, Triple Door was packed to the gills. And now, I think I can see some tumbleweed going across the 17th row. On the other hand, Facebook is continuing to accrue new users at a pretty amazing rate. And if you throw in other social networks from around the world, this graph is even more impressive. And social games revenue, while it's not climbing at, at quite as steep a ramp, is still growing. And the Casual Games Association, in a study, um, predicts that in the year 2014, social game revenue will be $8.4 and although the platform certainly isn't as friendly for new entrants as it was a few years ago, it's still possible for new companies like Playtika and Jiwa to get a foothold in the door. And after several years of progressively clamping down further and further on virality, Facebook during the last year has once again begun to open up the platform and either um, make the viral channels a little easier or create some new viral channels. So basically, um, it's not the easy money that social gaming was a few years ago, but it is still a pretty good and a pretty profitable place to be. So our format remains the same as it's been for uh, the years that we've been giving this. We identify 10 top trends in the social games industry, and then we pick a game to illustrate each of those trends, do a deep dive on that game, and then look at the lessons it teaches us, those games teach us about where social gaming is today and where it's going. So our first trend is, the rise and fall of hogs, or hidden object games. Hidden object games have for many years been the most popular genre in casual, casual downloadable. But until recently, there were no hidden object games on, uh, on Facebook. Then a little over a year ago, played and released Gardens of Time, um, which uh, peaked at about four million uh, players. And in January of this year, Zynga followed with a similar product, Hidden Chronicles, which peaked at about 8 million players, and it seemed like we had a new giant hit genre in social gaming. Which brings us to the first game that we're looking at today, which is Blackwood and Bell Mysteries. This was Playdom's second hidden object game, or its, its follow-on to Gardens of Time, and it was basically a reskin of Gardens of Time. Had a similar core mechanic where you had a decorative space, and the more stuff you placed in the decorative space, the more hidden object screens you unlocked. And then the more you played those hidden object screens, the more money you, you earned to buy more stuff for your decorative space, and the more XP you earned to unlock new things and better things for the decorative space. But wait, did I say it was a reskin? No, it was a totally different game. In Gardens of Time, you join the Time Society. In Blackwood and Bell, you join the Blackwood and Bell Detective Agency. In, in Gardens of Time, your decorative space was a time garden. And here it's an evidence yard. In Gardens of Time, you would access the hidden object screens with a time machine, and here it's a Zeppelin, etc. But seriously, there were some significant differences between the games. 
Blackwood and Bell intentionally had a darker uh, hidden object screens, both literally and thematically. Here's a typical hidden object screen from Gardens of Time. Compare that to this one from Blackwood and Bell. The Blackwood and Bell ones were harder to do, so you scored less points, so you had to play them more in order to achieve mastery of each hidden object screen. And uh, a viral currency was required to expand your decorative space. And an interesting and fairly subtle difference is that Gardens of Time started out really simple, and then um, lots of additional systems and features were kind of larded on over the past uh, year plus. Uh, some examples of these, a collection system was added, complete collections and turn them in for um, uh, new decorative items for your garden, um, upgrading wonders and other buildings, and time-limited chapters where in addition to energy you also needed a viral currency to play each screen. So Blackwood and Bell being built on the Gardens of Time code base and either benefiting from or suffering from uh, a year's worth of business intelligence on Gardens of Time had all of these features in right from the get-go. And so it was a much, much more complicated sort of initial user experience for the early adopters in both games. And the result? Well, we have two games from the same company, very similar. Presumably the results were about the same, right? Wrong. Blackwood and Bell peaked at less than a fifth, the peak of Gardens of Time. But maybe Blackwood and Bell was just an outlier. <laughs> However, Gardens of Time and Hidden Chronicles have both been shedding millions of users over the past year. And we've had some other hidden object releases. This is Hidden Haunts, a pretty photorealistic hidden object game from Making Fun, which is a division of News Corp, launched in February and is holding at about 50,000 DAU, which, which isn't that good. Then played and released a third hidden object game, Animal Kingdom where the hidden object screens primarily are looking for different species of animals. Some very well-known species. Can anybody find the tiger? And some pretty obscure species. Can anybody find the great bustard? Hello, anyone? And finally, there was Lost Legacies from uh, Smeet. This actually just launched a few weeks ago. So far, it only has about 60K DAU, but you know it's still pretty early to, to say whether that's anything approaching their peak. So anyway, what are the lessons from Blackwood and Bell and about the uh, hidden object space overall? The first is that in a maturing market, AAA quality is absolutely essential. I think the, uh, the harder hidden object screens in Blackwood and Bell really hurt the game. Getting everything about a hidden object game right, except for the hidden object screens, is like getting everything right when you build a sports car except the engine. Also, I think the, um, that added complexity at launch for Black Wind and Bell was another thing that hurt the game. Finally, or secondly, um, uh, a reskin just isn't going to cut it, especially if you're reskinning your own game and that game is still live and enjoying millions of players. And finally, given the short development time in social gaming, our market can saturate with just um, kind of blinding speed. So we've been doing this talk for a few years, and when we started off, one of the trends that we noticed was that there was sort of hardcore games beginning to, to bloom on the platform out of all the casual stuff that there was a, there in 2009. We've gone on, we sort of thought that that trend was going to die back, that 2010 had been a banner year, and every time we find another example of a super successful hardcore game. This time, we wanted to take a quick look at Marvel Avengers Alliance from Playdom. So uh, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at this game. It's moderately popular on Facebook. Um, how hardcore of a game is it? Well, let's see. It's a superhero-themed, squad-based, turn-based strategy game. So pretty nice and casual on the whole, you know, very pink. Uh, but seriously, uh, this is a very deep strategy game, heavy stat systems, lots of deep decisions to make on every single turn in terms of which heroes you're going to make, how much of their stamina you're going to drain. Uh, there's a lot going on here, how you punish the timeline in a, a, a sort of a Final Fantasy-style battle, team on team. So there's a ton of player decisions to make and a ton of depth cooked into the system. You build up a team of superheroes. You recruit them, paying for them in a special currency. You level them up, unlocking new moves and new attacks. The player 
themselves is represented by a shield agent, an avatar in-game, who has his own barrage of stats, attacks, and even special items that can be equipped. And there's a whole technology tree that the player does research on to unlock new items and power-ups in the game store. Because with great power-ups come great responsibility. <laughs> so is it a Facebook game at all, right? I mean, is this just kind of a Marvel-themed Final Fantasy Jack hammered into an iframe? Uh, it actually does a brilliant job of borrowing a lot of strong, well-established Facebook gaming conventions to kind of drive stickiness, recurrence, and make it familiar to players on the platform. Things like a variety of timed re-engagement mechanics for earning currency or unlocking new tech. Um, the standard left side icon bar of missions and goals for the players to follow so they're never lost and they have great guided progress through the game. And of course, a uh, wide variety of viral opportunities including even the sort of dirt standard nags and, and marginal neighbor benefits that you see typically in Facebook games. So, and how is that viral package working out, by the way? Uh, pretty well, at least in the case of my inbox. After stepping away from the games for a few weeks, I came back for 400 live invites. Uh, so this is an interesting case study of seeing that hardcore players in general, and men in particular, actually will respond to viral prompts if well packaged and integrated into a game. So how's the game performing? The game's holding very, very steady at about 1.5 million DAU, which is a pretty solid performance, right? It's probably top 25 game in terms of traffic. The stickiness on it looks very solid, around 18% DAU over MAU engagements. So that's a key leading indicator of game longevity. So players that like playing this are playing it fairly often. How does it monetize? So it's got some standard mechanisms. It's got special items that are overpowered that are available only for hard currency that boost your stats. It's got your usual sort of early unlocks and energy bundle purchases, um, speed up, time re-engagement. One thing that it did that I thought was really interesting was to create two special purpose currencies in the game. So most game currencies you can use for multiple kinds of purchases, make strategic decisions about how to spend them. Here, there are two specialized currencies. There's the, uh, the blue points, I can't remember exactly what they're called, that are used only for hero recruitment. And then there's the purple points which are available only for skill training on heroes. These are both very difficult to obtain through the grind, easy to obtain virally or through monetization. So what's the overall output of these monetization systems, including this particular innovation of the specialized currencies? With about 1.5 million DAU, it's the number 14 grossing game on Facebook. So apparently no complaints in the cash department as you would expect from a Marvel licensed game. Now, when we did this section at GDC, we were kind of hard pressed to find strong performing hardcore games that we saw great public performance indicators on. Not so much this time. There's a lot of stuff getting out there. Not all of it has won, but all of it's making interesting impacts. We saw uh, Armies of Magic. So this is a hardcore sort of army uh, wave propagation game. The City Builder from Playdom. War Commander from Kixai. Real time combat, uh, player versus player. Battle Pirates, also from Kixai, has some really interesting spins on the, the sort of building and fighting dimensions of these hardcore games. Um, Army Attack from Digital Chocolate, although it's in decline now, showed some really interesting traction early in its life cycle uh, before it went off in a super heavily PvP direction. One thing that I think is worth noting on these games, even if they don't show the traffic numbers of a Farmville or a Zynga Poker, is that if you can stick with an audience, you can see amazing revenue performance. So Battle Pirates right here on the day that I did this check was the number eight game on the platform in terms of monetization. The number seven game was Bubble Safari. Bubble Safari has about seven million daily active users. Battle Pirates has about 220,000. So, what lessons can we take away from this? First of all, much to my surprise, when I sort of saw hardcore games starting to stall in late 2011, it looks like the platform is always going to have room for this niche. There's always going to be a place to serve hardcore blue player or to serve blue players with a hardcore game. The games that are getting traction here 
are not the endless clone of backyard or endless parade of backyard monsters and kingdoms of Camelot clones and reskins that we've seen go across the platform, but some games that put in meaningful innovation in gameplay. So it seems to pay off, at least for your hardcore gamer. And one interesting lesson specifically from Marvel Avengers Alliance, this is the first sort of licensed game that we've seen get traction with hardcore gamers in the blue brand. So it looks like really hardcore brands can work on the platform. So that's a pretty interesting, exciting development. When um, social games first came along, there wasn't a lot of casual content. But then about three years ago, PopCap launched Bejeweled Blitz, which combined a casual mechanic, in this case, uh, match three, with a metagame, which was uh, basically uh, a weekly resetting friend leaderboard. Um, it was very popular, single-handedly vaulted PopCap to become one of the top social game companies. But the downside is that such a lightweight metagame results in pretty lightweight monetization. Then last year, um, Gardens of Time came along and took a casual mechanic, in that case, hidden object games, and combined that with a decorative space. Plus side is better monetization, the downside is uh, more expensive to make, longer time to build, and definitely a game which is uh, somewhat harder to tune. King.com has forged an interesting middle ground with its Saga series. Uh, the most successful example in this series is Bubble Witch Saga, but they've also done Pyramid Solitaire Saga, Hoop de Loop Saga, and the game that we're diving into today, Candy Crush Saga. So the format that all these games use is that the metagame glue that ties the casual mechanic together is in the form of a linear map. And this is a, a metagame that we've seen for many years in casual downloadable games, but not in social gaming until King uh, brought it over with, with this saga series. Um, an interesting advantage of this in social gaming is that at each stop, at each level along the linear path, you see pictures of your friends that have gotten to that point in the game. So there's sort of really powerful instant social proof with this metagame. Another interesting thing about Candy Crush Saga is how they've just about completely abandoned all pretense of an art style that has any appeal to a male audience. Um, any of you were at the, um, the Zynga panel earlier today, I mean, this seems to me to be exactly the kind of art style that they were denigrating and say would not work. Uh, whereas, you know, the results in Candy Crush Saga, you know, it's, it seems to be working pretty well for them. So the embedded casual mechanic in this case is match three, as in Bejeweled. Um, and the art style, while, well, you know, certainly, as I said, you know, totally aimed at a pink audience. Um, they certainly got it right. The, the pieces here are these luscious, colorful, lickable, edible pieces of candy. So with each level, the mechanics change up a little. There are different shape boards, uh, different winning conditions, such as this board, where you need to remove all that kind of gray jelly that you see behind a lot of the central pieces. Uh, you have uh, a mechanic where you need to um, make matches in order to have these ingredients drop to the bottom of the screen where you can remove them, and so forth. Um, a couple of interesting viral opportunities uh, which this metagame allows are as you pass your friends along the linear map, uh, you get a chance to, to post a viral boasting that you pass them. And at each stop on the map, at each level of the, the match three game, there's a friend leaderboard. And as you get a, a new high score, you pass friends on that leaderboard, once again giving you an opportunity to post a boasting viral. How does the game monetize? Well, if you fail to meet the conditions, the winning conditions for a particular level, you lose a life. Once you're out of lives, you can either wait until they gradually recharge, or you can buy more. Also, in the, uh, in the store, you can buy these permanent power-ups. For example, that first one uh, permanently raises the number of maximum lives you have. And I want to point out the prices here are the highest that I've ever seen for virtual goods in a social game. That middle charm there, is roughly $40 for a single virtual good. So King.com started as a skill game company on the open web, 
and they started dipping their toe into the social game waters. And thanks to this saga formula they came up with and their execution of it, um, they pretty much vaulted themselves into sole number two position in social gaming, at least in terms of uh, number of daily players. Um, and pretty much, in my opinion, they're the social gaming story of the year. So what are the lessons here? One is that the demographic of Facebook game players is very similar to the demographic of <laughs> players that we've seen in uh, the casual portals, casual downloadable market, and the mechanics that worked in those earlier places are, are going to be mechanics that work on Facebook as well. Second, if you can develop multiple games for, um, you know, that will be of interest to that demographic, you can cross-sell between them and thus acquire players for far less than it would cost you to acquire through the Facebook ad channel. And then finally, keep that meta gameplay the same from game to game, which will help kind of um, lower that on-ramp and make it easy for casual players to get into your game, but change up that micro gameplay, that embedded casual mechanic to keep the game fresh and different. Also, the advantage of this is that um, it'll keep your cost low because the metagame is remaining essentially the same from game to game, and that lets you concentrate on what really matters, which is making sure that that casual mechanic is you know, as perfect and, and, and as uh, polished as you can possibly make it. But cautionary note here. We've seen this before. 2009 to 2010, the story of the year was Crowdstar um, that had amazing success with their sort of hyper-casual sim games like Happy Island and Happy Aquarium. Then 2010 to 2011, it was Wooga with a bunch of Blitz-style games like uh, Diamond Dash and um, Bubble Island. And now this year, King. So Crowdstar's fortunes declined, and this past year they pivoted it out of social gaming completely. Wooga's still doing pretty good, although they've now dropped from number two to number four. It remains to be seen. Will King uh, build on their success of this year, or will they become just another flavor of the year? So when we did this talk two years ago, uh, we really struggled to find an example of a licensed game that was successful at all on Facebook. And about a year ago, we saw the, the first really successful licensed title emerge, The Sims Social. It's a trend that's been picking up steam you know, over the year. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. But I want to take a minute to deep dive on Sim Social and what made it work first. So for anybody who hasn't played it, the Sim Social fundamentally is a crossbreed of the Sims box product, the most popular PC game of all time. Made simple and coupled with a great viral package that really lit up Facebook as the game sort of surged across the network. So in what ways was it similar to The Sims? Well, as in The Sims, you are controlling a character. You have to watch out for that character's needs, make sure that they're taken care of. You build relationships with other NPCs through sustained interactions. You have a variety of objects in the environment to interact with to build those relationships, to take care of your needs, to get stuff done, build skills. How is it made simple? Um, I grabbed a couple of random UIs from The Sims, like this one, for showing off how you build your skills in this multi-client hierarchy, which you're using to sort of build recipes that might get you ahead in a job. Uh, no clear indication of what to do or how to do it to get on further versus the Sims social. Dirt simple ladders, unlock them one at a time, hammer the button with your energy until it's good to go. This is character traits, again, big multi-client hierarchy, dense text explaining what's what, versus Sim social traits. Buy this with currency, here's what you get. Really nicely, cleanly expressed. Um, I think EA Playfish did a great job also of really adapting some familiar Facebook gameplay metaphors to make Sims gameplay feel right to Facebook players, to people who've been paying uh, Farmville and Frontierville. Things like bringing in energy costs for actions, um, experience and levels, which are very familiar to Facebook players, and of course the ever-present borrower friends that you can visit, interact with, and send gifts to. The viral package was extremely potent. This thing absolutely lit up everybody's Facebook wall for months that I know. Um, some of them involve certain interesting interactions between Sims, right? So there's a lot to brag about in terms of in-game events and stuff that went on there. Uh, there was also a great crafting system that gave players great incentives to go back to their friends over and over for materials that they could beg for, right? 
Um, these power-ups gave you a nice boost in the game, definitely effective in stimulating viral activity. Um, and then the game was also loaded up with goals that you absolutely needed to have friends in the game to interact with in ever-increasing numbers to sort of socialize with them, have specific interactions with them to achieve your goals. So how did it do? The game actually peaked, unfortunately developer analytics has shut down some of their historical numbers, but it peaked at about 10 million DAU and was for a time the number two game on the platform. These days it's down to about 3 million DAU. Uh, that might seem like a big decline, but I will say that that is a number a lot of people would be happy to be down to. And the game is pretty stable there. And it's managed to retain a strongly dedicated core audience with DAU over MAU stickiness hovering around 20%. Uh, one interesting thing, this thing sort of did so well, combined its brand and its gameplay so effectively, it actually managed to maintain a clean slate on the platform for a year with zero competition in the life management category. It's just starting to creep in now with Zynga's The Ville. Playdom has announced its own competitor, City Girl, which puts a very pink fashion spin on life management. That's been announced but not yet released, so it'll be interesting to see how that does. But I think perhaps more interestingly, over the past year, we've actually really started to see a number of licensed titles take off and get traction. Things like Caesar's Casino from Playtica. Slinga from Zingo. So this is <laughs> Slingo from Zynga. I didn't rehearse that. It just came out that way. Um, you know, so that's a result of a license of a long-running web game that's been around forever. We'll hear more about that later in the presentation. Marvel, which we talked about a little bit earlier, again, is a, a rather strong performing license game. And SimCity Social, recently launched, I think, has a, a shot at being something big on the platform. So what can we take away from this? So although I've been focusing on examples of successful license games, the number of unsuccessful license games, things that have crashed and burned with TV show and MMA licenses, you know, is much, much higher. You need to have a great game. A brand will not carry you on the platform. A brand will drive trial, but not conversion. Number two, if you can take great gameplay and a relevant brand and combine them effectively, you can take over the platforms. As I said, SimSocial was at 10 million DAU and dominating the newsfeed. But number three, even with that potent combination that can let you shoot through the market, when we did this talk a year ago, we said, you know, it's a category killer. There's never going to be anything else here. It's still a competitive enough environment that you can never scorch the earth quite permanently. So be aware that even if you do go down this path and have that big hit, a brand is not an adequate defense to permanently seal off a category on Facebook. With just about any, am I on? With just about any area of gaming, um, games start out really simple and basic. Just look at the almost all text RPGs that were the staple of social gaming in its early days. And then as the marketplace becomes more crowded, um, a kind of production bar spiral warfare begins. And we're certainly seeing this in social gaming as well. Case in point, Zynga's Castleville. So basically, Castleville is just a really, really high quality reskin of Frontierville. It's got a lot of the same mechanics that we saw in Frontierville, clearing, town building, farming, very casual combat, and animal husbandry. There's also a simple crafting mechanic and a very robust neighbor visiting mechanic. What are the differences? Well, you could build a freaking castle, and a pretty good one, too. Also, uh, interesting advancement in the art of expanding your land. Um, it features the same expand in chunks that we saw in Cityville and in Empires and Allies. Um, but what's interesting is out in the unexpanded land, what the game calls the gloom, there are these interesting little things that you can see but not interact with or own yet until you expand and claim that land. And some of these even interact with you and give you quests. So, Frontierville with a few new twists and really high production value. How's that doing? Game launched in November, peaked about a month later at 8.5 million users, and currently, as it nears about its 8-month eight, eight birthday, 
it's at about three and a half million users. Oh my god, you're saying. It's shed like half of its user base. The game must be doing horribly. Au contraire, the game is doing incredibly well. Remember that a Zynga game, because of Zynga's cross-sell power, because of its domination of the ad channel, because of just its high profile as a game maker on Facebook, it's going to peak incredibly early compared to the slow growth that you'll see from a game from a smaller company. To show how well Castleville did, let's compare its first 120 days with two other games from Zynga that were released about the same time, Empires and Allies in green and Adventure World in purple. As you can see, Castleville peaked higher and retained better than either of those other two games, which, of course, also enjoyed the Zynga advantage. So why is this? I would say that a big reason is because of Castleville's very high production values. In fact, when the game was announced by Zynga in October, the press release spent quite a bit of time talking about the production values of the game, the storytelling, the animation, and especially the orchestral score, which, by the way, is now for sale on iTunes. What are some other games from the past year that have exhibited this new ratcheting up of production values? One is Raven Sky City, the sort of final glorious gasp from low laps before they were shut down by six waves. And SimCity Social from EA Playfish. Marvel Adventures Alliance. And Farmville 2, which has been announced and demoed and which um, has been beta tested in a geo-locked Philippines test, but has not yet launched in the US. But which, according to all reports, seems like it's once again going to raise the production bar of social games. So one lesson is certainly that the social games market is maturing, uh, especially in uh, very established genres like the builder genre or the hidden object genre. And within those mature and established genres, the production bar is rising, which means higher costs to develop, longer time frame to develop, and higher costs to support your game once it's live. So this is not an area of social gaming where you want to try breaking in if you're not already an established competitor in the social gaming arena. So in our sixth thread, we'll be taking a look at some of the evolution of the viral channels and the state of the art in virals on Facebook. And we'll be taking a look at that through the lens of Zynga's Bubble Safari. So uh, many of you have probably played Bubble Safari at some point. Uh, it's a pretty popular game, about 7 million DAU. It's a pretty standard issue bubble game, and there are a lot of those on Facebook right now. So there's an array of colored bubbles. You shoot bubbles into it make groups of three and they come down. Uh, if there's some unsupported stuff, it comes tumbling, the usual stuff. Um, knock 10 bubbles out of the top row and you pass the level and get to go on to the next one. Um, you know, fail to do that uh, or to earn enough points when you run out of bubbles and you lose and lose some energy and get to try it again. Um, now, I'm gonna give you a shocking statement about this particular game. This is a game was not the first hit Facebook game in its genre. Let's breathe for a moment. OK. Uh, got that out of the way. So uh, in particular, I think it owes a lot to Bubble Witch Saga, which had been a huge hit, also hitting around 7 million DAU on the platform. Um, a lot of parallels between the games. Of course, that in turn owns a lot to uh, Bubble Island and to Snood and the many bubble poppers before it. It's a very established genre of casual game. It does bring a few innovations to the table, just to be fair, like these fireballs that you get if you manage to drop balls three times in a row, and these beehives that send out angry bees and make you fire random shots if you don't deal with them soon enough, but yeah, it's a bubble game. But what was interesting to me as I looked at it is kind of the, the depth and the veracity of the kind of social and viral integration, going above and beyond your standard leaderboards, one of the things they did that's a very social feature that requires use of a viral channel is a strong UI emphasis on these bubbles from friends. So these are extra bubbles you can use in the level you can only get through a viral channel. Not only do they call them out nice and loud during the game, but at the end of every game, you get to know exactly how many points each friend bestowed on you through their special bubble, right, and get to send them a little viral back in return. 
Uh, at the end of every area, there's a big shiny obstacle that cuts you off from the next area that you want to play, that gray area that you see in front of the truck, and of course that requires some crewing to get through. Um, there's you know, all these viral bumps all over. But one of the things that was interesting to me, and I, if I want to see where virals are loosening up or where the boundaries are, I usually look at a Zynga game first. Um, I saw some really interesting stuff that reflected updates in Facebook policy about how the virals were sent. So this checkbox here, select all, is actually something that was completely illegal, would have gotten you thrown off the platform a year ago, right? Two years ago, it would have gotten your virals churned off for a week, if not your game. This multi-selection, right, where you can just sort of manually have lots of friends and send to them at the same time, was explicitly against platform policy from 2008 until early 2012. And they've gone as far as to, within the Facebook UI, add a massive viral facilitator in the form of the don't ask again checkbox, so that you can now have a kind of silky smooth sending conduit to these friends that you like sending virals to. Hopefully they like receiving them, but they're not asking them at the moment. Uh, so where else can you look for this? Uh, I think, again, if you want to see what's on the forefront of utilizing the viral channels, look at a Zynga game. Unsurprisingly, I'd also say, take a look at the other big players. The level of viral aggressiveness in these games has been increasing a lot over the last year as the viral permissiveness of Facebook has been increasing. Uh, you know, Steve and I were sort of uh, speculating that this may be well, we'll talk about it in a moment, but let's talk about the lessons really quickly. First of all, viral still matter. People are investing here deeply. This is a free source of users, not only for growth, which is how everybody saw them early in the channel, but also for re-engagement. Coming back to games that you've been in in Facebook is not the easiest of experiences, so if you don't have that constant presence in front of your users, finding their way back can be difficult. The platform is opening up. Uh, it's probably opening up for a couple of reasons. I think uh, Facebook is a public company. It's seeing traffic go off to mobile, needs to shore up revenues. So facilitating games and game revenues is an important way of continuing to grow their revenue stream. I think they've also gotten much, much better at figuring out who likes and doesn't like games because it's a very schizophrenic audience on the platform and serving the right communication to the right group so they feel good about loosening up the inputs so long as the outputs are appropriately throttled. And the last thing I'd throw out is we've seen this sort of profusion of virals coming out not just in casual games, but in some really hardcore games like Marvel Avengers Alliance that we did a uh, deep dive on earlier. Your audience may be ready for more viral play than you think. Um, I would encourage you to do some experimentation and see what they will and won't accept rather than work off assumptions. So in addition to covering the, the big games and, and the well-known hits, we also like to take a look at the hidden gems and the interesting experiments as a way for studying the role of innovation on the platform. So this year, we're looking at a game called Triviador from a uh, Hungarian developer called THX Games. Triviador is actually a suite of games. There is one set on a world map and then a bunch that are set on different country maps, such as uh, this version, Triviador USA, set on a map of the US. Um, basically, the game is like a combination of the board game's Risk and Trivial Pursuit. Or another way to think about it, it's Risk, where the outcome of combats are based on how well you answer <laughs> trivia questions rather than on the roll of dice. So there's a first phase of the game where you're figuring out who controls which and how many starting territories. And so all three players, it's always a three-player game, all three players are asked a series of trivia questions. And interestingly, these are all numeric questions. So generally, you know, you're not going to get the exact right answer. It's merely a matter of how close you are. And the player who's closest gets two armies to place, whose second closest gets one army to place. Then, once all the territories are taken, you enter the second and main round of the game, where players take turns um, take, uh, choosing another player's territory to attack. And then those two players answer a trivia question and if the attacker gets it right and the defender doesn't, the attacker takes over the defender's territory. And after the game is over, depending on how well you did, how many territories you controlled at the end of the game, there's a bonus round where you can get money and power-ups and stuff. So, what works about Triviador? 
the numeric trivia questions are just pure genius. Normally, the reason trivia doesn't work is either you know the answer and the question is just boringly easy, or you have no frickin' idea, in which case the question is just frustratingly hard. But with these numeric questions, you're, you're able to make an educated guess, and, and this feels much more fair and much more fun. Unfortunately, the list of what doesn't work is a bit longer. Um, people don't want to look stupid. And the idea of answering trivia questions real time in front of strangers is just a recipe for making people think they're going to look stupid. Then, as with all real time multiplayer games, there's a built in delay while either the game matches you up with opponents or decides that there aren't appropriate opponents to match you with and then fills in with AI bots. Then there's this odd marriage of genres. Anytime you kind of take two disparate genres and, and smack them together like this, you kind of hope that the addressable market is going to be the sum of the two circles. I think in this case, it's the intersection of the two circles. That is, I think people who like Triviador are going to be people who like World Conquest games and who like trivia games. Finally, there's um, the game, rather than going on until one player has taken over the entire map, the game just ends after an arbitrary number of rounds, which makes the end of the game feel both sudden and unsatisfying. So how's the game doing? It's a little harder to tell because there are so many different trivia doors, but if I add up all the ones that are listed on app data, my best guess is about 200k DAU, which isn't exactly a hit, but it's a pretty decent number for a small Eastern European developer. What are some other innovative games from the year? There's Triple Town from Spry Fox, distributed by Playdom, uh, which is sort of a match three game on steroids. And there's Woodland Heroes, which uh, was done by Rochambeau and is distributed by Zynga, and combines a builder with uh, a sort of battleship-like minigame. So what are the lessons here? One is that innovation is a way for uh, a small a company to get a leg up in a fairly crowded platform. Um, however, the key is innovating well. You can't just innovate for its own sake. Um, and finding something which is both new and fun is really hard. Also, just as it's really easy to innovate too little, it's also really easy to innovate too much, especially when you're going after a broad casual audience, which is somewhat uh, phobic about how much new stuff it wants to learn at a time. All right, so in trend number eight, one of the things that we've seen really get traction over the last year on the platform is an increasing number of intellectual properties moving over from the mobile space onto Facebook, right? So for a while we saw a lot of stuff going the other way. Now we're seeing the flow start to reverse. So we thought we'd take a quick look at this through uh, the lens of Angry Birds Friends. So um, you might be familiar with the core gameplay of Angry Birds if you, say, own a mobile phone, seeing as it's pretty much been one of the top-selling mobile games of all time, almost since release. Uh, or for that matter, if you, uh, say, eat breakfast cereal, watch cartoons, uh, or, you know, buy plush toys, or, you know, breathe. Um, so Angry Birds has come onto Facebook with substantially the same kind of gameplay. There's not a lot of differentiation in the core. You are flinging birds at structures, trying to knock them down and assassinate the evil pigs that are hanging out in there. Um, you know, it's as it was. Um, they've done some nice things. Oh, if you kill all the pigs before you run out of birds, you pass the level, get a star rating, um, you can go on. They've done some nice stuff like giving you a bunch of different single player gauntlets you can run. So if you get stuck in one place, you can go off someplace else, grind, earn some power ups, come back, you're rarely frustrated. Um, they've also added an interesting social feature in their weekly tournament. So this involves playing a gauntlet of four tear inducingly difficult, excruciating levels that are just incredibly hard to pass. If you pass all four levels, then you get a score in the weekly tournament. Um, you know, that gets broadly compared to your friends. There are prizes, there's nice inducements there. Uh, the problem is they made it a little bit uh, too hard. As you can see, I was a little bit lonely atop the leaderboard of my friends 
uh, over the last week, uh, which worked out okay for me because my score was pretty bad and I got a bunch of power up, so I was pleased. But uh, I think they may want to revisit this feature a little bit. They've done a good job, though, of making it feel social, putting leaderboards everywhere they can at every opportunity, along with viral prompts, main menu, end of level, the tournament. Um, they're constantly reminding you that your friends are playing and how you're comparing to them, giving you viral opportunities as you catch and pass them. Um, they've also tried to project a little bit of social identity through a kind of decent avatar system, so you can have some fun with the IP itself. Nothing to write home about necessarily. Um, they have done some really clever, interesting things with the viral channels. This was my personal favorite. When you brag about beating a level in Angry Birds Friends and you post a news feed, um, your friends can actually click on that news feed and play the level right there in your news feed. The flash will run, right? Um, so this is actually kind of fun and enticing to send, fun and enticing to receive. Just curious, has anyone ever played a level in this fashion in a friend's news feed? So one of the things that Steve and I were talking about is that this is often the kind of really clever viral thing that everybody thinks that they will totally own the platform if they can do. It doesn't always quite pan out that way, but it is pretty clever. Um, and I will say, outside of that, the game virally is very, very weak. Uh, you'll notice that this is a kind of very dated uh, UI for sending invites, doesn't do any of the grouping, doesn't take advantage of any of the loosening up of the platform. Uh, there's no reason to have neighbors. There's only one kind of gift in the game, the mystery gift. And the results are, in fact, uh, reasonably predictable. So how does it monetize? Uh, they do sell some of the avatar pieces. My guess is that this is uh, not a great source of monetization. Uh, they do seem to get some reasonably measurable revenue out of selling buckets of power-ups that allow you to pass particularly difficult levels and keep on crashing through, maybe actually survive the weekly tournament at some point. Um, the game isn't, unfortunately, all that sticky. It's doing reasonably well in terms of traffic, holding quite steady around 1.8, 1.9 million DAU. So people are coming back enough at 12.5%. They're getting enough cross-promo power. Um, it's not the top, but for me, it's, it's interesting for a number of reasons. Um, and we'll get to those reasons momentarily. One thing I did want to flag, 1.8, 1.9 million is not the top trafficked mobile game on the platform. If you take a quick look here, I blurred out the non-game applications just to draw a little focus. Two of the top five traffic games on Facebook today are mobile originating IPs, Words with Friends and Draw Something. So what can we take from all this? First of all, it's become very, very clear over the last year that IP that originates on mobile and even gameplay that originates on mobile can get real traction on Facebook. Um, there's clearly a mass casual audience on both. A lot of the same play patterns in terms of turn-based, leaderboard passing and so on work really well in both spaces. And there are large enough, well enough money concerns in the mobile space now bringing stuff over to make this direction work. Number two, and this kind of surprised me to be saying this, so Angry Birds Friends is a fun game. It is Angry Birds. You are throwing birds at pigs. There's nothing wrong with that. It is not a great Facebook game. The level of adaptation to the platform, to the viral channels, the socialness is, is pretty light, and it's still getting good traction. So I guess that does say, to a certain extent, we may be in an era where if you have good gameplay and can shove enough users at it, great platform adaptation may not be critical to your success. Um, and number three, this trend is picking up steam. Um, a year ago, two years ago, there was nothing coming over from mobile. There was lots of stuff. There was Cityville and Farmville going over from Facebook to mobile. This year, we're seeing a real profusion. And I expect, by the way, to see this trend increase rather than decrease as more and more stuff originates in mobile, comes over to Facebook. So a big area of growth in social gaming over the last year or two has been in the gambling game genre. But um, most of the early participants here were small players, Playtica, uh, Double Down Interactive, Buffalo Studios. But now we're starting to see some of the big boys come into the schoolyard. Case in point, Zynga Slingo, which, as it says right on their load screen, the game that combines slots with bingo. <laughs> So this is not a new game. In fact, it's quite venerable. First appeared on AOL in the mid-90s, 
then on the open web, casual downloadable version, a mobile version, Amazon Kindle version, a slot machine, a scratch card, and for all I know, microwave oven, uh, Etch-a-Sketch, and GAFU master versions. So the, um, the Zynga version at its core is, is similar to all those earlier versions. It's played on a five by five grid like a bingo card. You have 20 spins, each spin produces five numbers and all you do is find those numbers in the columns above each number. There are regular jokers which lets you pick any number from the column above it and super jokers which lets you pick any number on the entire card. So how did Zynga socialize and Facebookize this game? Well, they added power-ups, which you can buy or which you can grind for. They added a leaderboard for each level. They added a very typical energy mechanic. They added dubers, which you could collect. And they added friend jokers in addition to regular jokers, which behave just like regular jokers, except it gives Zynga an a opportunity at the end of the game to put up this viral prompt. They also added a metagame framework which is achievement-based. Each level has five achievements, and when you get that achievement, you get a star. Amassing stars unlocks new levels. The game starts out really simple, but as the game has been live, and as I've been getting deeper into the game, um, more and more complications have been appearing, such as seven by seven boards, which quickly become the norm rather than the exception. Daily challenges, uh, irregularly shaped boards, boards where you're looking for symbols instead of numbers, and so forth. So how's the game doing? Launched in March, peaked at about 4 million DAU, and currently it's at about 2.5 million DAU. Pretty good for most people, okay by Zynga standards. But the really interesting thing is to look at monetization. Three out of the top four games on Facebook right now are in the gambling game genre. And this is particularly amazing when you think about the fact that Double Down Casino and Slotomania, the number three and four games there, have far, far fewer DAU than a lot of games that are below them on this top grossing games list. And uh, Slingo is number 10 on the top grossing game list at the moment. And there are some other entrants in the gambling game genre from big companies. Zynga also did a bingo game this year, and PopCap EA did a game called Lucky Gem Casino. So, what are the lessons? Well, this started out as an area of social gaming that was very welcoming to small indie developers. But with these big companies coming in, that's certainly gonna be changing fast. And as I pointed out, these are really startlingly well monetizing genres uh, particularly given the incredibly light uh, metagame that sort of ties together the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. And why is that? Well, people are not particularly used to buying virtual goods, but they're incredibly used to paying for gambling. Also, um, there's quite a bit of talk um, that in the near future, gambling could be legalized across the entire country. And so I think a lot of these big companies are not only making a play for the dollars today, they're potentially angling to make a play for the big, even bigger dollars tomorrow. All right, for our 10th and final trend, which is curiously both forward-looking and backward-looking, uh, I'm gonna talk fast so we can all get to drinking. Here we go. Uh, we wanted to take a look at live synchronous play. So live synchronous play was a big deal uh, in the early days of the platform. So look at games like Scrambles and Poker back in 2007, 2008, this is the way a lot of people were playing, it really died off very strongly in 2008, and only now are we really starting to see a category revival. So we thought we'd take a look at this through the lens of a game called Pool Live Tour. So how many people here have heard of Pool Live Tour? Anybody ever seen a viral for it? So about two, three people in the auditorium. Um, just so you know, it's a pretty significant sleeper hit. Uh, as we'll see, it's got, there we go, over 2 million DAU, so looking you know, pretty steady in the 2 to 2.1 million range, um, and good stickiness again, about 20% DAU over MAU ratio. Uh, so that's a great success indicator. It's from a little indie developer called uh, Giwa, off in Czechoslovakia, or Czech Republic now, I guess. Um, it's a top-down 2D pool game, 
Um, it is something that was super popular on the web about 10 years ago. There was a great one on Yahoo. I did a, a similar one on Pogo. Steve did a similar one on World Winner. Eight ball, nine ball, international rules, you name it. But, you know, it's pool. Um, you start off playing eight ball with a naming guide and unlock more variants as you go through different venues. Um, it's got a nifty little metagame where you unlock different places and variants. Um, you unlock them by winning games, which gets you experience points. Also, each player wagers a little bit of soft currency uh, on each game. The winner takes it all. And the amount wagered increases as you move up through the venues. Um, they do do a great job of adding a little bit of stickiness to this metagame and adding a little bit of virality by making a really big deal out of their achievement system, which is very well populated. This is one of 14 pages of achievements available in the game. There's about 300 to grind through. Um, they also have a really nifty little metagame element where as you unlock new venues, you unlock new queues, which have better performance characteristics, which you have to buy with the soft currency that you're betting and hopefully winning in games. Um, in addition to wanting to buy a better queue, the other thing that each queue has is a battery. So when the queue is out of battery, you can no longer uh, shoot with it, just like my real life battery operated pool queue. Uh, and you need to use some soft currency to refill it. Uh, it's got a cute little avatar system uh, where you can sort of import your photo and then they can use it to do emotes like this, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, the game, again, is kind of weak virally, which is kind of a shame because it's pretty sticky. So they basically have your brags and boasts for winning and achievements. And then aside from that, the only other thing they've got uh, which, you know, does work out okay for uh, a live game is they use the Facebook chat channel to let you ping your friends who are online and challenge them to a game. Um, it's a cool idea, but honestly, I've never seen one of these chat invites and I've never seen anyone really get traction with this particular feature. Um, the game looks like kind of a weak monetizer. We'll get into more details, but it's only got a single currency and they give you more than enough for a kind of low-level player to play indefinitely every day when you log in. So there's very low monetization pressure through that because of that big source. Um, they have tried to create a few new syncs like fireworks that will go off for a day whenever you win a game. I doubt that that's much of a driver. Um, they're showing display ads, which also tends to in indicate relatively weak monetization. Um, Part of that may be that the game's audience looks to be highly international. Uh, they participate in a lot of cross-promotion app strip type deals that seem to really focus on third world traffic. Uh, you can look at the national flags of where people come from. And I should also say Rudolph is looking you know, pretty good today in my estimation. Um, so, you know, pool live tour, does not monetize well, clearly. I think the developers are getting a lot of their traffic not through advertising, but through cross-promotion. Uh, the reason I circled it here, Pool Live Tour, as we noted, has about two million DAU. Uh, this is the Facebook top grossing chart. The game above it, Vampire Diaries, gets sucked in, has about 60,000 DAU. Uh, the game below it, Grand Poker, has about 100,000. So clearly we're looking at, at fractions of a cent here. But that said, even without the money, it's still hanging on to the users, without the money and without the big ads. Um, this is one of a number of games with live components that we're seeing have traction right now. Um, as Steve noted earlier, Zynga Poker is currently the most trafficked top revenue game on the platform. It's five years old. It's extremely focused on live play. Wild Ones is now three years old. Uh, it's a game that uh, I worked on when I was at Playdom. Uh, it's quite steady right around the 500,000 DAU level without a lot of advertising, promotion, or live maintenance. So that's hanging in strong. Trivia which Steve mentioned, has some interesting stuff going on with its 200,000 DAU community. Um, and interestingly, Zynga has noted now that they're doubling down on synchronous live play on Zynga.com. So this is a screen that they released at Zynga Unleashed showing head-to-head -head play for Bubble Safari. So this is their little lobby screen gathering up players. Uh, so clearly, they see something there. So what can we take from this? A lot of the games that we saw up there are really uh, old. Singapore is five years old. Wild Ones is three years old. Uh, if you can get players interacting live, forming bonds, 
having a good time playing together at the same time and really interacting directly, you can develop a community that is deep-rooted, long-lasting, loves working with itself and each other, and that can really sustain your game over the long term. Number two, Facebook is a platform that is literally built for letting you interact with your friends when they are not online, right? The platform's built for that, the viral channels are built for that, games subvert it in various ways. Um, it is not built for letting you find other strangers online right now. There are other tools for that. That's what live games are all about, so it does present certain challenges in terms of getting quality virals together. Um, and the last thing is, um, typical high monetizing Facebook games often have fairly short session times. We're seeing a lot of third world traffic in a lot of these games. So you're going to have to be, I think, reasonably clever to get the monetization that you want in most cases, uh, just because they got more time there to play. So I want to thank you for sticking it out. Uh, I know it's been uh, end of the day, long session. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for staying. Uh, we are over time, but if you have some questions, uh, we'd be happy to take them until they turn the mics off. Thanks. Yes. Yes. So the question is, um, Marvel has four currencies and has had at various times a fifth that was sort of time limited related to special missions. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So, so I'm going to actually shape the question slightly. I would say, first of all, the amount of top level currencies that you want to show in your front and center UI, particularly to a casual audience, is kind of limited. I think five is sort of pushing the boundary on that. Obviously, we've seen fairly deep crafting systems in a lot of social games that involve large profusions of ingredients and collectibles that live under the surface. Um, what I would say is that if your currencies are serving a really distinct purpose in terms of monetization, in terms of gameplay, you can have them in there, but it's probably approaching a threshold at that four to five level for the top line. It also starts to become kind of a, a semantic issue, you know, is something a currency? Talk into the mic. Is something a currency or is something a resource? So, you know, if if those um, those currencies in, in Marvel, which, you know, are kind of portrayed as coins, instead were portrayed as, you know, a piece of wood or, you know, a barrel of oil or something like that, you know, you might not think of them as, as currencies, and yet they would be filling the exact same niche in the game's economy. 